the MCU, the most ambitious film universe that has ever been realized. Well over a decade in the making, it has spawned some of the greatest cinematic moments in history. Well, maybe just to me. Infinity War and Endgame delivered what many believe to be the pinnacle of superhero cinema. But here's the burning question. Can the MCU ever top Endgame? Let's get into it. Welcome to A Marvelous Life. I'm Nashology, and today we're not just answering that question, but we're diving fully into it. From the early days of Tony Stark's transformative journey to the cataclysmic battle against Thanos, these moments didn't just define a franchise, they defined a generation. But apparently, all good things come to an end. As we ventured into phase four of the MCU and beyond, there's been quite the shift. So much so that you can't scroll for more than five seconds without encountering a video talking about the inevitable death of the MCU. Masterful storytelling, compelling villains, and apolitical narratives that have absolutely nothing to do with superheroes. All of this and more seems to be missing from our favorite universe. And boy, oh boy, it's only getting worse. The MCU is changing before our eyes, but is death truly on the horizon? Here are the top three reasons why the post-Endgame MCU is failing. Phases one through three gave us some of the most compelling character arcs in superhero history. Take Tony Stark. We witnessed his transformation from a self-centered, totally egocentric industrialist to the ultimate sacrificial hero. And no, I am not talking about his sacrifice at the climax of Endgame. In the very first Avengers, he was prepared to sacrifice his life to end the Chitauri invasion. This depth of character development offered emotional resonance that allowed us to glimpse into the heroic underpinnings that would soon define Tony's character. But it doesn't end with Iron Man. Steve Rogers himself has shown considerable bravery in the face of adversity. His character consistently grapples with his ideals in a world that continuously changes and challenges his views, especially in films like The Winter Soldier and Civil War. Now, let's contrast this development to that scene in the post-Endgame landscape. Phase 4 has been about one thing and one thing only – expansion. With the MCU in full swing, major emphasis was placed on both expanding the universe and expanding its diversity, and that was accomplished in one astonishingly simple way – more characters. A lot more characters. I mean, the comics have never shied away from introducing a massive assortment of characters. Whether you're looking at the Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, or even the X-Men, the ever-expanding roster is just that – ever-expanding. Now, taking this concept and shoehorning it into a cinematic universe where we're expected to emotionally connect with these characters in a very finite amount of time is both outrageous and incredibly impractical. Let's look at some examples. The Eternals sought to develop a large ensemble of characters within a single film. Ten characters in total. Well, eleven if you count Jon Snow. <laughs> you absolutely need to count Jon Snow. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Despite their diverse backgrounds and powers, the Eternals were criminally underexplored, with their millennia-spanning stories condensed into brief flashbacks. The result? We just don't care about these characters, even as they're trying to save our planet. Another example would be the awful development of Jane Foster in Thor Love and Thunder. Last appearing in, quite possibly the worst MCU movie to date, fans were expected to care about a character designed as a failed love interest ten years after her final appearance. Let's be real, the development here was incredibly weak. The movie starts and before you know it, she's Thor. She may be worthy, but certainly she didn't earn it. Not like this guy did. Her motivations and the emotional weight of her illness were completely secondary to the plot, whereas the destructiveness of cancer should have held center stage. Sorry, Taika, but you dropped the ball. 
These examples suggest that while Phase 4 continues to introduce interesting characters and narratives, the focus on hero expansion has come at the cost of deeper, more nuanced character development that was the hallmark of earlier phases. Gone are the days of the few men and women who would band together to stop the apocalypse. Now, the world is full of heroes, and they are multiplying by the minute. The scope of the post-endgame landscape is ambitious, but with a rapidly growing universe, Marvel will need to learn to tighten their focus before we no longer care about the men and women behind the masks. Okay, let's move on to arguably one of the most important elements of a good story, but one that is butchered all too frequently. Yep, I'm looking at you, Agatha. And you, Crow. And while we're at it, Taskmaster was pretty wasted. And really, don't get me started on Arthur Harrow. Okay, okay, you get the point. The first few phases of the MCU showcased some incredibly well-written, heavily nuanced villains that allowed the growing landscape of the MCU to flourish. The motivations, the menace, and the moral complexities of some of these villains were fascinating. And more importantly, they believed wholeheartedly in the righteousness of their cause. Take Thanos, for example. He wasn't just a big bad, he was THE big bad. A genuinely terrifying presence and, for all intents and purposes, he was the hero of his own story. A demeanor borrowed heavily from the comics, although executed in a completely different way. But so what if his motivations were different? The level of execution caused even die-hard comic book fans to stand in awe at the Mad Titan's unshakable presence. And then we have Eric Killmonger, played by the always incredible Michael B. Jordan. This guy wasn't just an adversary to King T'Challa, he was a dark reflection of Wakanda's isolationist policy, an artifact of colonialism that affected African bloodlines who weren't protected by the high vibranium walls of the Hidden Nation. His motivations were therefore compelling to us as viewers due to his justifications being rooted in both personal and historical trauma. And as far as origin stories go, it wasn't hard for the average viewer to get behind Killmonger's stance on Wakanda's failure to act. But let's not kid ourselves here. You and I both know the first three phases had many villain problems. But in many ways, the failures found in the pre-Endgame MCU should have insulated Phase 4 and beyond from the same mistakes. Whiplash from Iron Man 2? He was a stilted mess, and I'm not actually sure if Mickey Rourke was acting or just drunk on set. Abomination? Literally no reason for his existence, besides the obligatory finale showdown. And how about Ronan? Oh my god, let's not talk about Ronan. So it's obvious phases 1 through 3 had their issues. Nobody is questioning that. But they also produced some of the greatest pop culture villains in the last decade. So, why are the Disney Plus TV shows full of complete, unadulterated garbage, such as Ethan Hawke's incredibly lazy performance in Moon Knight, one of the most talked about shows leading up to its premiere? And don't forget Najma, the villain from Miss Marvel who I guarantee you forgot about 10 minutes after finishing the show. That is, if you even watched the show. Wanda, although one of the greatest characters in the MCU, fell incredibly flat as a villain. Sure, she was horrifying and legitimately scary, but it felt awfully contrived. Comic book fans know that Wanda went through a spiral of destruction in the comics, causing the Avengers to disassemble, killing several members including Hawkeye and Vision, rewriting all of reality to create the House of M, and then finally erasing the mutant gene from most of the population. WandaVision began a promising story of Wanda falling to the dark side, losing her family and everything she wanted out of life. No matter how much good she did, she just couldn't win. But it's all <laughs> ruined in the multiverse of madness. Instead of being powered by grief and loss, as in the comics, the MCU throws a MacGuffin at us in the form of the Darkhold. Oh, so Wanda isn't really going crazy? It's a magic book that's making her do this? Yeah, wasted. The villainy continues to fall flat no matter what post-endgame property you look at. 
Carly Morgenthau could have been a good villain under different circumstances, but once again, she leaned more towards radical ordeals than a sympathetic resolve. This created a rather annoyingly brash character who wasn't scared to cause chaos in order to get what she wants. Really, I could go on and on. From Darben's weak resolve in the Marvels, to General Drakov's typical Russian villainy, to the biggest controversial point I have to make yet. Kang the Conqueror, the one who's poised to topple the Mad Titan's reign. Now, I'll just get this off my chest. Kang is no Thanos, Kang is no Magneto, and Kang is certainly no Doctor Doom. He's a great villain in the comics, to be sure. He's a mastermind with a genius-level intellect and a master strategist. And he does have what it takes to be a universe-ending foe, but he simply doesn't have the gravitas of Thanos himself. In Loki, he's presented with a fairly silly, offbeat personality who lacked a menacing presence. Yes, this wasn't going to be THE Kang who would eventually threaten our heroes and our multiverse, but in my opinion, it was a weak opening introduction to the Time Traveler himself. And matters were only complicated from his appearance in Ant-Man Quantumania, where a variant Kang, in a much more grounded performance, was defeated in the climax by… Ant-Man? Ant-Man. Let's be honest here, Ant-Man should have been killed in that movie. Kang should have won. But that's a discussion for another day. As of this moment, Kang isn't stepping up to the plate in a meaningful way, and doesn't exude the world-ending energy of Thanos. Let's hope the Council of Kangs changes this perception and Kang steps up in a big way. Either way, the post-endgame villains need to step up their game and provide an avenue of meaningful, emotionally resonant villains. The heroes aren't the only ones who carry a multiverse. The Infinity War saga wasn't just a story, it was an experience. A complex tapestry that connected dozens of characters and storylines into a single, engaging universe. And boy, oh boy, it was a beautiful thing. The writing in the Infinity Saga did more than just tell a story. It wove a compelling narrative that finally brought our beloved comic book heroes to life. Sure, there were some writing pitfalls, but for the most part, the Infinity War Saga was lauded for its exceptional script writing. Take this iconic moment from the first Avengers film. This wasn't just an aesthetic choice, but a narrative one. The culmination of several movies worth of characterization packed into a single shot. Absolutely beautiful development. Or this one, the moment Peter Quill realizes the bonds that you make throughout life are sometimes the only family you ever need. A sobering realization that solidified Peter's trust and love for his team. But even more than crafting amazing scripts, the Infinity War saga did something else of note. They weren't wasteful. They crafted the heroes they needed to craft in order to develop the MCU towards its showdown with Thanos. It felt seamless and purposeful. But holy hell how things have changed. With the rapid expansion of the MCU, things have never felt more disjointed. Sure, we're officially in the multiverse saga of the MCU, but it seems like more and more properties are appearing that have nothing to do with the exploration of this concept. Everything seems so damn random, with America Chavez, Kate Bishop, and Miss Marvel, among others, appearing in the MCU, there's been constant chatter about the Young Avengers in the near future. Because we sure know how that'll be received. Oh, I'm okay. With Moon Knight and Jack Russell now here, the Midnight Suns is also hot on everyone's lips. But hey, why stop there? We have the incredibly unnecessary story of Rhodey and Armor Wars on its way. We have Ironheart rearing her head because why not? Instead of one Vibranium Nation, we now have two Vibranium Nations. We have She-Hulk, a new Black Widow, and a new Hawkeye. Because if you can't have the originals, why not carbon copy them? An almost complete letdown in Secret Invasion, a TV show about a character who is barely present in the comics, a TV show about a woman who shouldn't even have a TV show whatsoever, a new TV show about Daredevil, and never Never mind, he can stay. I think you get the point. The introduction and expansion of the multiverse, especially in projects like Loki and Multiverse of Madness, 
have added a layer of complexity to the MCU, a layer that objectively increases the excitement of the post-Endgame landscape. But with all of these extra products that seemingly have nothing to do with the multiverse, it creates an extra layer of confusion and complacency. There's now an eclectic mix of storytelling, with an inconsistent tone spread throughout. While diversity is nice in a growing universe, it lends itself to the ever-evolving feeling of disconnectedness. And this feeling is starting to alienate MCU patrons who have given the last 10 years of their life to this beloved universe. So where are we now? An expanded cast with diluted intimacy, an overwhelming plethora of properties, a disjointed narrative, and a fragmented viewing experience. But that's enough doom and gloom. The MCU is incredible. It's an expertly crafted narrative that focuses on bringing our wildest superheroic dreams to life. It has diverse characters, engrossing narratives, and a fan base that is beyond any comparison. The MCU might be faltering, but with the almighty Kevin Feige at the helm, they still have a shot at winning over the hearts of those who claimed the MCU died with Tony Stark. They climbed the hill to global domination once, and with enough directed effort, they certainly can do so again. For now, we'll keep our eyes fixed on the future of the MCU. But hey, it could be worse. You could be a DC fan.